few years back, four or five years back, all the top, the well-known top godly men of God had got together in the U.S. And they were interceding, a time of fasting and prayer and interceding, asking the Lord for the Holy Spirit to be poured upon for the final revival. And I heard the Lord told each one of them, the final sweep will not begin from Europe or US, it will begin from South India. And I believe we are one of the only, one of the only. I was not a respecter of persons. And I always ask God, if somebody were to ask this, what is your secret? The secret is we have no secret. But more than that, I think there are two classes of people everybody forgets. Everybody forgets. One are the HIV patients, not the sick. People visit the sick. People don't visit HIV hospitals. They keep away from HIV because they're scared. The HIV patients and the prisoners. And if you look, these are the two categories of people we poured our life into in the past three years. Now we are reaping the harvest from everywhere. Believe that. I believe. The prisons first, and then those two homes. The two homes in New York. I believe that changed everything. And I thank God we didn't quit. The pressure was so much, so much to quit. So much to quit. God, he was there and he's still taking us and it's not going to be 20 or 30 I believe in a couple of years it will be 200 300 churches God has got a funny sense of humor the beginning when I came into the ministry I was a real dumbo I had no idea what the ministry was coming from a Catholic family didn't know what ministry was didn't even know that pastors get offerings. I had no clue what the ministry was. When I began, somebody by mistake called me pastor. Oh boy, one of the old pastors was furious. How dare you call yourself pastor? I said, I didn't call myself pastor. They made a mistake. He was furious, he was angry. Who ordained you? Never call yourself a pastor. Till today, there's a crowd of pastors who keep asking, Who ordained you? Well, I know who ordained me. But you know what, today? There's a million people who call me a pastor. Not given by man. Therefore, man cannot take it away. It's not a title. It's not a title. All young people remember there are no titles in the kingdom of God. With those titles comes immense responsibilities. When God gives you that title, you realize the first thing you realize is your life is not your own. And if you're willing, you're willing. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Christ Jesus bids every man, come to me and die. Then you will live. So let's pray this morning. Father, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know thee. Open the eyes of my heart that I might know, Lord, the hope to which you have called me. Teach me, O God, to walk in that hope. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you remember last Sunday's message? Or do you only remember the jokes? It's still laboring in love. Now we are understanding why love is such a difficult thing. It's not boy met girl and ran around the trees for two Hindi songs and then got married. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's not so simple. That's why work of faith is simple. But love, scripture says, is a labor. It's hard work. 
And like I said last Sunday, you want to know what love is? Go to the designer, the original designer, who says, God is love, I am love. We need to always go back to the word of God, check our feelings connected with love, our actions connected with love, our attitude connected with love, tested with the original, to see whether we are walking in love. And last Sunday we looked at this and we found perfect love. Cast away all fear. Please remember it's fear that stops most people from doing a lot of stuff we need to be doing in the kingdom. It's fear. Whole different kinds of fear. Get you know the original. That's why we say please do not make your life one day matram. Only Sunday. Okay? Don't make it one day matram, though it's a beautiful song. But it should be seven days walking with God, studying the word, meditating the word. And don't get pushed by any situations. Those of you are called to ministry. You are not pushed into anything. We don't move before God's time. We stay until God tells you to move. Please remember this. If you got already one sheep in your little flock, stay there. I know for a fact that I go to any one of these churches, I have six meetings, thousands will come. It will be packed. Not a single country from where I haven't got an invitation. But I will not go. Until he says, you need to go. We don't have to rush before God's time. That's the strangest part of it. We've got churches all around the world and I haven't even stepped outside India. My passport still doesn't have a visa. I haven't applied for one yet. You don't have to. Don't rush. Stay there. Move when God tells you to move. We don't move ahead of time. We don't move ahead of time. Understand this. Some of you will have only two or three and God is watching you over the years. Are you faithful with what God has come into, into your hands? No. We don't want to increase before time. We don't want approval from men. We need approval from God. And we looked last Sunday one of the biggest enemies of love is fear. Fear and love are not compatible. Because fear will stop you from loving. That's the greatest danger about fear is fear will stop you from loving. Because fear is connected always with loss. While love has already counted the cost. Jesus said, count the cost. Somebody who has got the love of God. Remember the love we are talking about is supernatural. You or I cannot manufacture that love. And if you try to, that is why you will try for two weeks, three weeks and then you drop off. This cannot be manufactured. This is from above. We need to seek that from above. Receive from above. And as our brother Pavan said, Lord, teach me to walk in the spirit every day. Teach me to walk in the spirit. I want to love you with all my heart, all my strength, all my soul. And love my neighbor as myself. But teach me, Lord, what it is. And I need your strength. Because I cannot love like that. You need to love through me. So fear is connected with loss. While love has already counted the cost. Let us look at our table. Last Sunday's table. Remember, do's and don'ts. From 1 Corinthians 13. It's simpler to look at it that way to get an idea. Do's and don'ts of love. We have a whole lot of do's. Love suffers. That means love is long suffering. Love is kind. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. And love covers a multitude of sins. Don'ts. Love does not. Any. Love does not parade itself. Love does not puff. Behave rudely. Seek its own. Not provoke. Think evil. And then the statement is this kind of love will never, never fail. It cannot fail. That's God's love. God's love never fails. 
Modern psychologists say that negatives are not good. We should only harp on the positives. Leave the psychologists alone. God says something else. He begins with a negative. Remember, the first commandment in the garden is a negative. Don't eat from that tree. Not do eat from the tree of life. He says, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Seven of the ten commandments are negative. Three are do's. So don't go by psychology. You don't understand it because if we start thinking psychologically instead of according to scripture, we will start bringing it into the church. Therefore, you have two schools in the church. One will keep on telling we need to keep on repenting and keep on repenting and changing according to the word of God. The other says, no, you are the righteousness of Christ Jesus. It's okay, you can be whatever you want because one is harping on the positives. The other is saying, this is what the word of God says. It's psychology brought into the kingdom of God. It's not the word. Oh, today we will look at one of the negatives there because God thinks differently from us. We look at enemy number two to love. Love does not envy. Enemy number one was fear. Please remember last Sunday we looked at fear. Enemy number two we are looking at today is Love does not envy. And don't take suddenly this very lightly. Because envy or jealousy has destroyed more individuals, families, churches and even nations. Than probably any other emotion. Oscar Wilde comes up with these crazy stories. See he's got one of these stories. The devil was crossing the Libyan desert and he saw a small group of demons trying to tempt a monk to sin and failing. They are trying every kind of temptation. The monk is serene, he's not tempted at all. The devil said, Shh, wait, I will show you what to do. He went to the, he said, watch me. He went to the monk and whispered in his ear, he said, your brother has been made the bishop of Alexandria. The demons watched in surprise as the serene face of the monk changed into green with envy. He calls it the green eyed monster. What does he call it? Now, because somebody knew Shakespeare, don't be jealous. I'm not joking. Because somebody knew Shakespeare said jealousy is a green-eyed monster because to know Shakespeare in our culturally literate society is a big thing. So don't be jealous of the brother who said Shakespeare said this. I don't know how subtle it is if your English got an accent. I wish I could speak. Oh, he, should, he is showing off. That's why we need to watch. This is so subtle. It rears its head all the time. It's Iago who tells Othello, Oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It's a green-eyed monster, which does mock the meat it feeds on. Through the Bible, from the beginning onwards, it is scattered in the lives of almost everybody. Everyone. It begins with jealousy. You know that? The fall begins with jealousy because the enemy comes into the garden and is jealous of the special position Adam and Eve has with God. Something he had once, he had stood with before the very presence of God. Now we see his God walking with two of his creation, coming every day and walking with them. And he says, I don't like this. I'm going to set them up. It actually begins with jealousy, with envy. Envy is the author of murder. It was Cain's envy that led to murder. Which led to anger, which led to murder. You know that? Envy raises its head at home. Pink spouses. 
between siblings, at school, workplace, in the streets, everywhere. We need to guard our heart. We are talking about serious things that can take the crown away from your head. There was research for you and even really, really mess up with your salvation. Saul was messed up and killed himself. If you look back, it began with jealousy. We are talking serious issues over there, over here. How many spouses, marriages have been messed up because of jealousy? How many siblings have been fought because of jealousy? Classroom. I know, as a classroom teacher in the old days, I know. The poor fellow sitting at the back who is just hoping to pass when he gets his paper and sees 40, he is very grateful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The one who is first and second is always looking. How did you get your half a, half a mark extra? Show me your paper. Is it true? So my, my answer is exactly like hers, but she got two and a half, I got only two. And I show them, it is not exactly the same. Okay, I will show you where it is. But that's only two words, is it? Two words. Ask parent teachers meetings. The mothers go for parent teachers meetings. No, I also have a mother. All the years I studied in Kerala, there was some issue in the class. I know exactly what happened. My English teacher would always give me two marks or three marks less than the other, though I believed I should be taught. My mother was furious from Buddha to Kerala. <laughs> When I come there, I am going to meet him. I said, Ma, leave it alone, what difference does it make? Because the board exam is coming. You have to be jealous. Are you getting it? There is a board exam coming, which is conducted by God. <laughs> Nobody can tamper there. That's why God says, everyone will have to stand before me one day and give account. That's a judgment nobody can tamper with. But envy, jealousy leads to anger, leads to a whole lot of stuff. So board exam came and I did quite well. I know how well I did? My daughter knows. I talked in the state. And the teacher couldn't do anything. That's something nobody can do. You don't remember that because I don't think that I failed in class 10, that's why I'm preaching. <laughs> don't. Right on the streets, right on the homes, right in our classroom, right in the offices when somebody gets a promotion. Do we feel? That's why it's a labor of love. Labor of love. One in your group, you are all IT kids. One in your group with whom you are all dosti dosti till yesterday, share your tiffin all together, realizes tomorrow he is going to be your manager. No longer happy. No longer happy. You see, envy reared on earth during the first worship rep service recorded, Cain and Abel. Envy came, as we see in the Bible recorded, it's in the first worship service. He played the guitar, Cain played the keyboard, everybody clapped for Abel and didn't say, tell anything to Cain that you encourage me. Simple as that. Think. Every Sunday we have an offertory and every offertory different people do. Some offertories people clap more, some offertories people clap less. It's not controlled by God or anything. But for those who did not get much of an applause, if you were not playing it into God, there are certain emotions and sentiments that comes. 
even in the worship service. I'm not going to sing in the worship team anymore. How many people around the world drop out because they felt they were not appreciated enough? That was King's problem. He was mad. Not because his offering was rejected, he was even more mad because Abel's was accepted. We need to really, really keep checking our hearts. Do I really rejoice when I hear my brother has done well? Do I really rejoice? It's not enough to be neutral. It's not enough to be neutral. I don't care. That's not it. God says, let your love be either hot or cold. I'm not talking about neutral uses. You need to really rejoice when a brother, your sister, your colleague, your spouse does well. That happened with Abel and Cain. Shall you put it into Abel and Cain into modern story? It's Mama's birthday. Morning, when Mama comes down to the kitchen, she sees the little one has struggled and painted a birthday card and put lots of stuff and stickers and all kinds of stuff and scribbled and made a beautiful birthday card. Mama picks it up and puts it on a mantelpiece in the kitchen. And she finds the elder one as an afterthought suddenly remembered on Saturday night, it's Mama's birthday. She rushed to the first store picked the first card that came into it and wrote, love you very much, Mama, and put it there on the kitchen table. The second card is still lying there. The first one is there on the mantelpiece. After breakfast, the second one, the elder one asked, why is my card on the table and why is the one on the top? And he says, the first one was a labor of love, the other was an afterthought. So them go to school. They come back in the evening. They are playing out there in the garden. The little one is happily playing. And suddenly the elder one comes and says, Here is your car. Shreds into pieces and throws it. We see this happening all the time. The Cain and Abel story in different forms played out through life and through history. The same thing. So different. In stories like this we hear and we realize over there it happened the first time. Genesis 4 8. What jealousy leads to anger, to hatred. What does he do? Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. We don't know how it happened, but I believe, like, checked his composure, didn't show at all what was inside, and said, Baya, aaj hum bahal jayenge. That is all. I don't know what he used. I believe when Abel wasn't looking, he smashed his head with a rock. You think your sacrifice is offered because there is blood and there was no blood on my offering, then there shall be blood on my next offering. Take. A generation away from the Garden of Eden, walking in the very presence of God. You know why? Jealousy. That's the first thing God says in his don'ts about love. He says, love is not jealousy. If it was jealousy that killed the first, spilled the first blood on earth, Abel's blood, it was jealousy. It was also jealousy that ultimately resulted in the shedding of the blood of the Son of God. In Matthew 27, verse 18. Pilate, for he knew they had handed him over because of envy. The Pharisees are standing there as scribes and teachers of the law and he says he is done wrong according to our law and this law and this law and this. Pilate says, you can't fool me. It's no law. I can see right through you, you are jealous of him. Jealous of him. Because you wanted what he had. You know what, whenever he spoke, he spoke with power and with authority. 
You were jealous right from the beginning of his ministry. You followed him because you were jealous of him. And finally your jealousy has reached to a point. You have handed him over into my hands because you don't have the power to kill. I have the power to kill. And Pilate says he knew they had handed him over because of envy. So a set of people who knew the entire word, but there was no love in their hearts. And scripture says love does not Envy. We need to be very careful about envy. Don't take it lightly. Take it very seriously. James chapter 3 verses 14 to 16. This wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct that his work, works are done in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, so they go together. Envy and seeking of self. I want to be number one. I, I need to have my way in this. Envy and self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It is earthly, sensual and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. He says, there is a wisdom that comes... There's a wisdom that is there when you're seeking your own self, your own interest, your own desires, and you're envious of your brother or sister prospering in any area. He says there's a wisdom that comes, but it is sensual, earthly, and demonic. Cain's wisdom was demonic. He said, come brother, let's go out for a walk. Abel had no idea what he was planning. He camouflaged it so well. His brother looked the same as he looked any other day. It's demonic. Scripture says it is demonic. Reason, self-seeking and envy is going together. That's why we need to be very, very careful when we study scripture, when we judge, why, why the, 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 the message of repentance keeps on going. Why? Because we're constantly checking our own heart. Am I envious? Am I just seeking my own way in all of this? Because scripture says, every evil thing is there then. Watch. We check our hearts closely daily. Am I seeking my own? Am I jealous? Am I jealous? In your own particular situations, whatever it is, we need to ask. We need to ask. I need to ask myself constantly in terms of ministry. I'll be jealous if this stopped today and it passes, passes it on to another church. Our testimony stops with the last Sunday of August 2011 and the same testimony is transferred from September across the road. How will I react? How will I react? Philippians chapter 1 verses 15 to 17. Paul talks about this jealousy, envy, even in the church, in the ministry. He says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy. Preaching who? Christ. How? In envy. Do you realize? It's not, it's not a small thing, it's a very serious thing. Paul says some preach even Christ out of envy. So everybody who preaches Christ is not from goodwill. It's self-seeking and envy. One of the pillars on which this world system is built on is envy. Envy. And everything in this world system feeds to it. If you watch your news and if you read your newspapers, I hope you do both. It's very good as God's children to keep your eyes closely on what's happening around the world. You see uprisings everywhere, all around, including in India. A people's movement to eradicate corruption to Libya, to Yemen, to all over the Arab world, all over Europe. Young people all getting into onto the streets. Deep within, if you look at them, it's a longing for justice. It's a longing for justice. 
There's a problem with this longing for justice in the flesh. It looks only at the corruption outside and doesn't deal with the corruption within. And deal with the corruption within. When our God came the first time, He said, we need to deal with the corruption within. All his disciples thought we are going to, he's going to take over, the Romans will be thrown, and we are going to start the Messianic reign. He said, no, that's the second time. I will deal with the corruption outside the second time. First, let me deal with the corruption within. So I am telling you from according to scripture, none of these movements will succeed. Yes, never succeed. They will ultimately run into even more chaos. People will get even more disgruntled, even more upset, even more jealous, even more envious. And finally it will be so chaotic, out of this chaos will rise a man or peace who will say, I can put things in order outside. You, you can be as corrupt as you want inside, doesn't matter. I myself am corrupt within the Antichrist. That's how it will end. Social justice is important. But God says before social justice can come, let us talk about the corruption within. So he said, go preach the kingdom. Dealing with the corruption within. And then heal the sick. Feed the poor. All that social justice. But first deal with the corruption within. That's what you are seeing. Until we are willing to deal with that as believers constantly, we are going to be miserable people because we have eaten into the world system. The system that keeps on making us more and more jealous, more and more envious. Envious of others who seem to have got what you don't have. Every movie, every ad, every TV, everything feeds into it. Am I right? And the problem is the world is forever shifting the goalposts as to what is cool. And we have a generation who is forever racing to be cool and in the process our love for God and our love for man grows cold. Because we are running this race. We are running this race which is basically fueled by envy and jealousy and not out of love. Not out of love. It's out of envy and jealousy. Let me tell you, envy can destroy you and destroy families. Can destroy you and destroy families, destroy churches, destroy nations. Was a season until recently, like 20, 30, 40 years back before that. All the nations in the earth envied the United States of America. Everybody, everybody wanted to go to US. Just called the land of dreams, where your dreams can come true. Everybody, everybody wanted a green card or a visa to go to US. True? Everybody look. You know why? But nobody was willing to do what the forefathers had done. To pay the price which the forefathers had paid. Now America is no longer a land of dreams, it's more a land of nightmares. Because one out of ten people don't have jobs there. They are struggling. Really, really struggling. Why are they struggling today? Because they didn't deal. A generation rose that did not deal with the corruption within. And suddenly social justice and prosperity without, in a heart that has grown cold towards God and man will not last. Will not last. It will not last. And I'm telling you, if any one of us is building a structure without checking what are my foundation stones, is it truly love, love according to what God's word says, or is it actually fueled by envy and jealousy? Check, check. Turn with me Genesis chapter 37 and verse 3. It just says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. You got any dumb dad in the Bible? This is this guy. One man, two wives, two concubines, and 13 children. All this 
two wives and two concubines, let us say four wives, he loved only one. The wife he loved was Rachel. The others were all additions. The woman he really loved was Rachel. And the firstborn of Rachel was Joseph. That's why he loved Joseph. Problem is, he's a father. You can play favorites with your wives if you have more than one. But you can't play favorites with your children. If he had been given a choice, I believe he would have married only Rachel. But the choice was not given to him. And after years of waiting, she has a child, Joseph. The problem is when you have more than one child in every family, the equation changes. As long as it is one child, it's okay. Once it is more than one, does daddy mommy love him or her more? The older sibling is always watching how the younger one is being treated. That is why when the daddies and mommies presence is not there, they get a nice pinch. The girls have got many pinches. Often I am telling you it is not real. It is perceived that daddy loves him more than me or loves her more than me. It is not real. But sometimes it is, as in this case. Israel loved Joseph more. Does it say? Israel loved Joseph more. And as a sign of that love, now there is a visible symbol. It's not only something that is in the heart and which is shown in his words and his actions. Now there is a visible symbol. Scripture says, also he made him a tunic of a multicolor robe. Not an ordinary coat, mind you, 21st, 21st, 21st century, fox, multi color, full screen. You can't miss that coat. Everybody knows this coat is special. Now you will see if you study scripture carefully that coat becomes a symbol of envy and jealousy and discontent. To say is, but when his brother is so that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now you need to realize, Joseph is innocent. The culprit is Jacob. But the envy, the jealousy, the anger is directed at Joseph. But he didn't even talk to him. They were probably polite to him when daddy was around. When daddy wasn't there, they were real, real nasty. And scripture says in verse 5, Now Joseph had a dream. And he told it to his brothers. And they hated him even more. This man can't do anything right. <laughs> do you have any control over dreams? It's a dreamt. And he made the mistake of telling them. And they hated him because of the dream. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamt. Now he hasn't told the dream. He just came and told them, you know, and now I had a dream yesterday. This will be great. He's starting to dream also. That's all he said. He did not tell them what the dream was. Now he tells them, please. No, no, verse 6. Please hear this dream which I have dreamt. And you know what? Verse 8. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and now for his words. First the father's love, second the court, third the dream, now the words of the dream also. It's piling on because envy is not tackled in the beginning. The jealousy is moving to hatred, to real violent anger. And suddenly you will see the rest of them combine. The sons of Leah, the sons of Leah's concubine, and the sons of Rachel's concubine, all of them combine together, and they have one common enemy, that is Joseph. You know how envy makes strange bedfellows? 
It's a simple example, one in your group, in your office, who was one of your group, suddenly becomes manager, and the rest of you are one gang now. How did he become? What is so special about him? Now he is no longer part of your group. Everywhere it happens. Everywhere it happens. Envy that started as a breeze, now is taking the form of a hurricane. The problem is the real culprit is Jacob, but the target and the victim is Joseph. The problem with envy is that always our target is misplaced. You know why? Our jealousy, our anger connected with jealousy is actually towards God. Why did you give him the promotion? But you can't ask him. So, I will take it out on him. They should have been angry with Jacob and asked for a round table conference. We need to discuss some issues with you, Dad. What is, so, what is so special about him and in which way are we different? We have a genuine grievance. We are all your sons, right? We had no control that uh, Reuben didn't say, I want to be born only of Leah. Nobody had any control over their birth. <laughs> so, why do you love him more and why do you love us less? They could have asked Jacob, but they did not. And most people don't actually ask God. Their actual deep-rooted anger is against God. But what can you do with God anyway? But you can definitely do something to your neighbor. There you have power. There I have power. Because you can't do anything against God. You can some definitely do something to your neighbor. That's where envy comes in. See, Joseph, like I said, had no control over his birth. Joseph was not responsible either for his father's feelings nor actions, but he became the target. God is asking us, do we rage inwardly? What they actually long for within is absolutely legitimate. Everyone wants dad's love and dad's approval. There's nothing wrong in that. That's legitimate. Problem is we confuse these two, love and approval, as being the same. God says it's not the same. It's not the same. He says, for God so loved the world. Meaning, I didn't do anything to approve of that love. Please understand this difference as children, a lot of young people over here. These are two different things. Approval is one thing, love is another thing. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. What does that mean? It means God is not going to love me a little more tomorrow because I'm a little more obedient today. He says, you know, I've already loved you with as much as I can always love you from the beginning till the end. And I loved you when you were a sinner. And I came and died for you. My love is unconditional. My approval is not. My approval is not. Approval is connected with behavior. But often young people and older people in terms of God confuse these two. Approval is always connected with behavior. If you go to chapter, same chapter and verse 2, you will see something is happening over there. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilha and the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Let me tell you, put it across, don't misread it, this. Love your God with all your heart, all your might, all your strength. That's your loyalty. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. Judah is sitting behind the haystack and smoking. And Joseph goes and tells his father, Dad, you know what, Judah is smoking and you have told us we shouldn't smoke, right? Reuben is, Dad, you know what, I saw Reuben chasing that servant maid around. Jacob says, are you sure? Yes, dad, I saw. You, you have told us these things shouldn't be done, right? You know what? There is one boy in that family who is walking in the ways of the father. And the father puts a seal of approval over him and says, wear this coat. Those don't like it because they want approval and love to go together. God says, I don't approve that way. I love you all, absolutely. On the day of judgment, you will see, I love you all. Then in the spiritual realm, you will, you will bask in my love. But you will see that many won't get crowns. Because your behavior was judged. 
Your heart was judged. Your attitude was judged. Your works were judged. This is what happened over here. Joseph brought a bad report to his father about his brothers. Why? Because he was concerned about their father's name. But his father's testimony. And he knew his brothers were messing it up. So he brought. And God is saying, are we confusing between love and approval? Because approval, like I told you, is connected with action and attitude. Both attitude and action. Lord, I want your love. I love you. Lord, I want your approval. God says, get your attitude and your act right. Lord, love me. God says, what are you talking about? Don't you see the cross? What more can I show you, tell you that I love you? I loved you with an everlasting love when you were a sinner and my enemy. I can't love you anymore. This is how I love you. Lord, approve of me. God says, get your attitude and your act right. And I will also approve of you. Say chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20. You will see the attitude and the action goes together. God says, if you are willing and obedient. Willing is what? It's in the heart. Attitude. Obedience is action. If your attitude and your action tally, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse, even though I love you, if you refuse, even though I love you, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Who means the God speaking to, to Israel? Have love given Israel with an everlasting love. But you know what? If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. But if you are not, ultimately the sword will devour you. And we will say, how does the sword devour us now? God says, on that day, I will not judge you. On that day, he says, this, the sword that comes from my mouth, the word will judge you. And you will see, it has devoured all your rewards off. Don't touch my love for you. Don't touch my love for you. I have always loved you. If you're willing and obedient, Willing and obedient. You need the best of the land. He says, get your attitude hot and get your action right. Then I will approve of you. Did God ever stop loving Israel? Never. Did God always deal fairly with Israel? Always. Was he just towards Israel? He always was. God never stopped Israel, even now he loves Israel. He says, always there will be a remnant and I will save a remnant, I will come back for a remnant. His love for Israel, his love for the church never changes. Turn with me to Micah chapter 6. Verse 2. And words. This is the cry of God the Father to Israel. Hear, O oh, you mountains, the Lord's complaint. Whose complaint? Not man's complaint, the Lord's complaint. And you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people. And he will contend with Israel. What is the complaint? O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I buried you? Testify against me. Tell me. Can you answer this question? Any man or woman or Israel ever, the church ever answer this question? He says, tell me. I have a complaint. In which way have I been unfair to you? Do you have a complaint? I have a complaint. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I told you about my justice. I told you this is the way you need to walk. And I also told you if you this is the way you walk. All this blessing shall come upon you and overtake you. Now you have walked in disobedience. Now all this trouble has come. Why are you complaining? You tell me, he says, Oh my people, what have I done to you? Did I ever break my word with you? What I promised I always done, good or bad. It's the truth about all of us. All of us. Throughout history, 
God has got a complaint when we complain. He says, I got a complaint against you. I got a complaint against you. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses, Aaron and Miriam. Oh my people, remember now what Balaam the king of Moab counseled and what Balaam the son of God answered him and Akasha wrote to Gilgal that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give you my firstborn for transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Did I ask you any of these things? Did I ask you of any of these things? He said, I asked you of only one thing. He has shown you, O man, what is good. What is that? What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your Lord? That's all I ask. Is that too much? Is that too much? I got a complaint against you. I don't want your 10,000 lambs. I don't want your 20,000 liters of oil. I don't want you doing like what the pagans are doing, taking their own children and putting it in the fire for me. I don't want any of those things, sacrifices from you. I just ask you, will you do justly? Will you love mercy? Will you walk humbly with me? Getting it? That's what happens. This is what envy will do. Envy will turn our eyes on God and start looking at the world and we start to stop loving our neighbors. In verse 11 of chapter 37, suddenly you will see envy turns friends and brothers capable of, bro of murder. Suddenly brothers are planning and plotting and his brothers envied him. What did his brothers do? Envy. Is envy in the house of God? Somebody else walks in obedience and makes decisions which are tough and chooses to put God before everything else and then God starts moving in his or her life. Are you jealous? You don't want to walk that road but want the privileges connected with that road. He said, in that narrow road, there is life. No, I want to stick to the broad road, but I also want life. God says, they don't go together. They don't go together. There is envy among us, in families, in homes, in workplaces. The problem is, it can kill too. It can go up to murder. Verse 19 and 20. They said to one another, look this dreamer is coming, come therefore let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. We shall say some wild beast has devoured him, we shall see what will become of his dreams. Yeah? The minute your friend in your circle who was one of your friends till yesterday becomes the boss tomorrow, suddenly all his certificates are fake. Suddenly, suddenly, faster than lightning, there's a rumor spreading through the entire institution. You know what? The certificates are all fake. He was brown nosing the boss. You know what? He's the chief manager of Samcha. They already killed him before he has sat in that chair. Before he could take his place in the chair, he's dead. And next day, poor man very excitedly comes to take up his new position and he doesn't realize why is there so much hostility in all the departments because a rumor has been spread. Reason? Simple reason. He was approved for the promotion and you were not. Joseph was approved by the father and the others were not. So they said, let's kill him. Let us kill him. The problem is in verse 19. When your envy turns to hatred, you suddenly reduce that person, in, not into a person, just into a term. It's no longer a person, it's just a term. Dreamer is coming. Oh, quietly. Chamcha, are. Boska chamcha. Yesterday he was Deepak, my best friend. 
और शांति माय बेस्ट फ्रेंड शेयर द टिफिन ऑलवेज टुगेदर टुडे दैट व्हाट इज हैपनिंग टुडे ऑलवेज हैपन दैट डजंट मेक इट राइट बट गॉड स्क्रिप्चर शोस हाउ इट वर्क्स टू रियलाइज this is a whole set of brothers who are sitting there and not saying our brother is coming they are saying the dreamer is coming oh the preacher is coming also have nice terms verse 23 shows the opportunity they were waiting for came It came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. You know what? They didn't take him and cast him into a pit straight away. They first had to rip away that symbol of him. You know what? This coat, your coat of many colors. But when I see that coat of many colors, I see only one color, that is red. Your coat, your coat. everything is on that coat the anger is directed not only at that person but also the symbol of approval over his life look back think think when you are jealous or envious and angry with a person you not only attack that person you also attack that symbol which god has given him or her prepare apart we repeat apart how on the sea what you without that robe you're just a nobody like all of us if i can't have it nobody is going to have it we see that over and over and over like in real life and in movies you ain't going to be my wife you're going to be nobody's wife before the girl has left the threshold it's been spread half around the city she's left with half the town what people do in the name of love and i'm warning young teenagers sitting over there who put their trust in all these young men and women who come to you and pledge their loyalty the minute you turn them off they will go around and tell you you are like this zigar ho baazi ke i haven't seen please don't misunderstand this past i haven't seen I read only newspaper. Let me tell you honestly, before God, in the past 25 years, I have seen only one Hindi movie, and yet stories are spread in this city. How I used to go with somebody for all these Hindi movies, and when you take one story and another story and another story and another, now you have a dossier on the pastor. You don't ever cross checking the facts. See movies. See, maybe sit at home, but even at home, I don't see a Hindi movie. In the past twenty-five years, I've seen just one Hindi movie with my daughter and my son. We were bored. She was watching. She happened to be serious. This was the first Hindi movie in the theater for her, and she's sixteen years old, going to be seventeen. Oh, we love these tidbits that spread around. Stories. Let's put one more nail on him. Or oh, maybe another person. One more nail on her. They're waiting for stories like this. Are we getting the picture? This is nothing new. It's been happening for the past six thousand years. So don't get bitter. It will still happen until he comes. Just think back. Just think back for the stories we listen to. If I can't get her, nobody is going to get her. And we have all nice four-letter, five-letter words. Now suddenly to describe her till yesterday she was honey, sweetheart, lovey, ducky, everything. <laughs> why i'm talking about false love a lot of you have been caught in false love when we try to tell you get so offended but we know what the man or the girl has told us about you and we are trying to tell you it is false don't bank your life on it don't get fooled no eternity plus one year we will love <laughs> don't get fooled there are certain characteristics of love that is real which will never fail Doesn't matter what happens. 
Doesn't what a man happens. What does the, the gospel according to Matthew say? God, the gospel according to Matthew says what when Joseph found Mary was pregnant before marriage, he was a righteous man and he wanted to put her away secretly because he didn't want to mess up her name. I'm broken hearted. I, I, I can't believe you would cheat on me. But you know what? I love you. Maybe you didn't love me. Maybe you didn't love me because if you had loved me, you wouldn't have been pregnant. But you know what, Mary? I love you. So I just put you away secretly. I will not open my mouth and speak about you. And God came to Joseph and said, Joseph, that child is of me. She's godly, take her. That's what you need to keep your antennas up for. Is this real? Is what this dude telling you? Is it real? If it's real, let me cross check with the word of God. Is it real? Will it last? God says that kind of love will never fail. Even if your relationship breaks up and it, it, you go your different ways, you will still walk away guilt-free because you walk straight in that relationship. It may not be easy in this world because in the easy in the world when everybody comes against you, especially a lot of broken relationship, broken marriages sitting over here, you want to defend. But God says, don't defend. Don't say anything. Shut your mouth. If you want, share. But one or two close friends of yours whom you can trust, share. But no, don't defend. Don't say anything. You know why? Because that person is also my child. Keep it in the family. But I'm talking. But we don't see it that way. And that's what they're saying. Let's rip that coat off him. They're all brothers of Joseph. You know that? the other Joseph and we ripped his robe and we didn't put him in a well we put him on a cross up there and say let the whole world see your nakedness if you are God come down let's see we're talking about power we're talking about science you're doing all these miracles right <coughs> we're not going to put you in a well we're going to put you up on the cross and we're going to take that robe which your father had given you Let's see how long you will stay there. And they stood around and mocked him and said, If you are God, come down. We are all guilty about that. Even if we are guiltless about everything else, when it comes to the cross, we are all guilty. Because we, you and I, put him upon the cross. Now his life is spared only because Reuben intervened. And they did the second worst thing they could do. They sold him. He's gone, sold as a slave. Now the damage is done and he's been sold. You have to cover up. And also you have to appear in a cemetery. So what did they do? They took the coat, killed an innocent animal. Now an innocent animal has to die for your crime to be covered. Understand this, always in Bible it goes. The innocent always pays for the guilty. An innocent animal is killed. And they dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors. And they brought it to their father and said, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? Read that word very carefully. They did not say, Is this our brother's tunic? Is this your son's tunic? You gave him this, right? You should know better. He is their brother. They are saying, No, he is not our brother. He is your son. There is a difference. Do you know whether it is his son's tunic? He's no longer their brother. You see the casualty of all this is love dies. That's why we have to be very careful about envy. Love dies. Except in the heart of the 17 year old boy. Turn with me to Psalm 105 verse 17 and 18. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And they hurt his fetters, feet with fetters, and he was laid in iron. Are you getting the picture? Now, he is not his brothers. He is God. Now, we are getting a different account of the whole thing. Now, where is Joseph going? Joseph is going hands in irons, 
legs in irons. He's going. Help me tell you, he was not alone. All the way from his father's house to Egypt, Jesus walked with him. Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you, Joseph. Don't hate your brothers. Don't curse them. Don't curse them. Don't curse them, Joseph. I'll walk with you. You're not alone. What your brothers meant for harm, I will turn it around for your good because I see your heart. I see your brother's heart. I see your heart also. I will walk with you. Joseph, I will walk with you. Joseph, guard your heart. Now you are in danger. They will live in guilt. Now you can walk in bitterness and hatred. I want to guard your heart. Don't let bitterness, don't let anger, don't let hatred come into your heart because of what they did to you. Because now it's easy for you to be envious because you are a slave and you can think about how your brothers are having a good time at home and then you can be jealous of them. Now the role can be reversed. Joseph, don't do that. Don't do that. You need to understand the death thing Joseph has to go through now. It's not the same. He's tested. He's innocent. And he's being tested. And he's winning. He's battled. What about the brothers left behind? What is, they, what is that they wanted? The love and the approval of the father. They mistook the approval for love. That's what they wanted. Oh, now Joseph is out of the sight. Our father will love us. Did the father love them? Verse 33 to 35. And recognized him and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but they refused to be comforted. And he said, I shall go down into the grave to my son in the morning. Thus the father wept for him. Did you get the picture? Joseph Jacob has become a classic case of depression. He's not capable of loving anybody anymore. What did you want? Your father to love you. Well, your envy has reduced your father to a point he can love no one. Envy never pays. It never pays. In the end, it never pays. You wanted your father's approval and love? Well, classic depression. He's gone into depression. And he's not going to come out of it easily until he hears one day. Why? Getting the picture? Envy never pays church, it never pays. Being jealous about somebody, something somebody has, some position somebody has, it never will pay you. Never. That's why God says, do not covet. Do not covet. Do not long for something that is somebody's. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. That is what God is asking Cain in Genesis 4 and verse 7. And all through history, that one question is that one statement of God reverberates through history. What is that question? That statement God says? God says, If you do well, will you not be accepted? What is God saying? God is saying, Jeruk and Nisha, Studi, I love you with an everlasting love. But if you do well, you will also receive my approval. You don't have to look at what is in Abel's hands. You just have to do what is right with what is in your hand. That's all it takes. That's all it takes to get God's approval over your life. You have to go into the word of God and see what is that God demands of us collectively as a people. And then as the Holy Spirit meditates, ministers to you, you will also know what the Holy Spirit demands of you as an individual. And then God says you are approved. But I always love you. I always love you. If you do right, will you also not to be accepted? This is the cry of mankind. Lord, accept me. God says you do what is right. I have already told you what is right and what is wrong. And I have told you when you go wrong, this is what you need to do. Come back, put it right, start walking with me. You can't walk Contrary to what I have spoken and then expect my approval. I'm sorry, I don't do that. And sometimes even in a church as a pastor, I struggle. Because you confuse my approval with love. I love you, period. I love you, period. 
approval is a different thing approval is connected to what the word of god demands from each one of you it's not mine to approve i didn't set the standards the standards were set by somebody else i didn't set it the standards were set for you it was set for me for all of us it was set be confused between the two don't confuse between the two god loves you always always he loves you and that is the confidence we have to walk in obedience because i know i can never be separated from his love from by the portion in romans what can separate me from the love of god nothing except if i choose to walk away from his love but he will still love me he will still love me even when you are sitting in the pig pen he will still love you because god did not love you or me because he found something meritorious in us he loved us period because he created us and we confuse between these two you need to realize jealousy will lead to anger jealousy will lead to finger pointing and all these things that happen in our day to day lives at homes workplaces everything it's because we are envious we are jealous that's why god says love does not envy Luke chapter 15 and verse 25 very familiar story now his older son was in the field as he came he drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing balle balle ye balle balle kahan se aa gaya what is happening over here he didn't go so he called one of the servants and asked them what are these things meant and he said to them your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound your father has killed the fatted calf note this note this note every word that is written in the in the bible the servant specifically mentioned the fatted calf because he was also jealous and thought the prodigal son did not deserve that feast the fatted calf is kept for special occasions in a jewish family remember David asking is there anybody in the household of Saul to whom I can so favor for the sake of Jonathan and Ziba said there is Mephibosheth but is lame in both feet meaning if he hadn't been the previous king's son his worth nothing would have been thrown in the gutter but he is a son's king's son so what can you do even if his feet is lame he has to be carried your response will show the envy hidden you have to add that information there the information is added because he is also jealous jealous then begins the rhetoric the father comes out but he was angry and would not go in therefore his father came out and pleaded with him son please come in it's just brother's birth party please come in and what did he say so he answered and said to his father lo these many years i have been serving you i never transgressed your commandment at any time and yet you never gave me a young goat that i might make merry with my friends but as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlot you killed the fatted calf for him sound familiar then begins i did this 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 and she did this she did this she did this she did and you are now having the party for her it's not fair every family faces this every one of his faces or her faces will face it a list of my achievements and list of accusations of where he or she failed and you are blessing him god you are blessing her ultimately my anger is directed against god how can you bless that man or that woman don't you know what she is don't you know what i have done Do you know what she has done? Don't you know? You're getting the picture. That's the prodigal son's brother. I served, I slogged, I slogged, I served. Verse thirty. It's familiar. What did Joseph's brother said? Is this the tunic of your son? What did the elder brother say? Now this son of yours comes, not my brother. He doesn't say when my younger brother comes home. He says, "This son of yours comes, and you're already throwing a party for him." Getting the picture? Father is saying, "My son, you mistook it all. You didn't have to slog for my love. My love was always there for you. I always loved you both." And you know what he says? 
His father says, son, you are always with me and all that I have yours. You have my approval. You don't understand that? You never have to slog for the love of God the Father. You cannot slog for the love of the Father. It is free. In that case, he said, what were you slogging all this time for my love? You don't have to slog for my love. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You have to slog for my approval. That you have. Everything that I have is yours, not the younger brothers. But love, it's equal for both of you. He will also sit at my table and eat. You will also sit at my table and eat, but you will rule, he will not. You didn't understand my heart. You didn't understand my heart. How come, elder brother, you didn't understand? Do you remember those days after the younger one walked out of the home? Do you remember dinner at the table? It was so silent because there was one chair that was empty and always kept empty. Do you remember mom getting up and walking away so many times saying, I can't eat? Have you risen in the morning? Didn't you see your father standing by the window and looking? And when he turned around, wasn't the eyes full? You see? You see the heart of the father. That his heart was broken over a brother that had gone missing. Was your heart so cold when you worked so hard for my love? How is it, brother? You can labor so hard for the love of the Father, and yet your heart is so cold for the love of your brother. How is it possible? That's a question God asked the church. How is it possible? How is it possible? How is it that we are not moved when we see a generation that is perishing? How is that we are so casual when we know the one who is sitting next to us and to the left and the right is going to an eternity without God? Yet you are laboring in my love. We don't have to labor for my love. Three, you need to labor for my approval. When you labor for my approval, you will start witnessing. Because you love your brother now. In the picture? Are we getting the picture? We confuse. We get so confused. Because deep inside there is envy. There is jealousy. Because everything that the father did, he looked at it as if my father is grieving over my brother so much, that means he doesn't care for me. He had also confused. How is my love for him understood? Has my ignorance of him? No. It's not. Often in families, homes, churches, everywhere, we are misread. We read God wrongly. If God's hand of approval comes upon Raj, that means I am not approved. God said, no. I am not loved. God says, no. I love you. And if you do right, will you also not be approved? Will you also not be approved? This is what's happening. The problem with all this is that we don't realize what envy actually does. Envy will try to kill Joseph. Joseph is our future. Right? Joseph is your future. Joseph is the future, the provision God has made to secure your future. And you are trying to kill that very thing that will save you one day. That's what jealousy does. We become blind. We become blind. And we kill the very thing, the very people who would have rescued us one day. If Joseph had reacted the way the brothers had reacted, the brothers and their families would have died. In the picture, are you understanding how God is saying, this is not what I want you to do? When he says, don't curse, bless your enemies. Don't, don't do that, don't do that. You know what? You curse your enemies, it will come to pass. You cut off their words. Don't worry about the words, you cut it off. Every tongue that raises against the opposition, you say those words will have no power over my life. But don't curse them. 
Don't curse them, bless them. Because if you don't bless them, they will die. Because you are the Joseph in their lives. Don't let envy kill Joseph. And we are called to be Josephs in this world. We need to be careful how we walk. Do you know why love is a label? It's not easy. Love is a label. It's tough. And I'm talking to this church and to thousands who will hear it over the weeks. All the ones who listen to the messages are from broken men and women and children. The same message I keep telling them. You just can't hate the ones who hurt you. Simply can't do that. You will die. And they will die. You will die. They will die. You are the Joseph in their lives. Stay calm. They put chains around your feet. They put chains around your hand and they have sold you out in this world. You have no name. You have no reputation. Your robe has been taken. You have been disrobed. Don't bother. There is one who is walking beside you. He says, when the season of testing is over, when the word I gave you 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, is proved in you, you will be approved of my father. Walk. Walk with me. Walk with me. Don't react like your brothers. Don't react like your brothers. In chapter 3, verses 26 to 30. Disappeared on the sea. And suddenly, in modern terms, new kid on the block. There's an old kid in the block. His name is John the Baptist. But the new one has come. And some of John's disciples came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. Till yesterday, everybody went to the wilderness to see John the Baptist. Now a new ministry has begun called Jesus Ministries. Everybody has turned to direction and they are running to Jesus. And somebody is coming and says, John, you know what? You know why the crowds are not coming for your first and second service anymore? No, why? Because Jesus has started service at the same time. And they are all going there. John has a classic response to this. He says, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. And you yourself bear with me witness that. I said, I am not the Christ. But I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. Can I put it in terms easy for you to understand? If 2012, in the month of October, I come back to Grace Tabernacle and I find Pastor Vijay is preaching and the church is packed and you have five services. You know what I should say? He should increase and I should decrease. God gave me 100 people. That's my joy. God gives him a thousand people. That is his joy. I cannot take his joy. That was not meant for me. A man should not have anything other than what is given from God. My brother Sidney may have 21,000 people. I rejoice with him every day. Every week I rejoice and encourage him. Don't quit. Don't quit. I am thrilled to bits, brother. I am thrilled to bits. All of those pastors. They are new kids on the block. I share in their joy. I don't covet their joy. Tell him before God, I don't covet their joy. If this is what I tell every one of them, you know what, brother? My church is the smallest. They say, Pastor, is it true? He said, It is true. Your Bible study has more people than my church. But if that is what God has given me, that's all I should have. I shouldn't have anything more. You cannot beat envy, jealousy in any other manner unless you are content with what you have now. If you are not content with what you have now, you cannot receive something tomorrow that will make you happy. You will be even more envious for something else. Romans 12 and verse 15. 15. Rejoice with those who... What does it mean? Put it simple terms, celebrate the success of somebody else today. He goes back tomorrow and finds one of the girls in her team who probably was a laziest has got a 
promotion. You want to have to fight envy? You tell her, whatever her name is, Shanti or Kiran or whatever, I'm taking you out for lunch today because I want to celebrate your success. And I made it from my heart. Only way you can kill envy. There's no other way. It's not that you take leave and run home to cry and call up 16 people and to complain how God is not fair. No, you rejoice with those who rejoice. On the other hand, nobody in your team was picked and somebody else got it. And there is somebody who was hoping and crying out for that race because he or she needed it and he or she is mourning. Scripture says, weep with those who weep. Then don't celebrate. We usually choose to do the second one. But they don't. Don't celebrate with them. Grieve. Grieve with them. Because their, their pain is genuine. Whatever it is for them, it's genuine for them. So why don't you weep along with them? You say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for you. Can I take you out? So you'll forget it at least for 5 or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Let me take you out. Let me spend some time with you. I don't want you to think about this and mourn. Let me help you to get over it. Understanding how scripture works? This is how scripture works. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Wonderful, wonderful man of God, Apostle Paul says, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. You know what it means in modern language? I know how to be happy with an old Nokia or with an iPhone. Perfectly fine with me. I am happy with both. I will not be super spiritual and if somebody gives me an iPhone and says no, I will be only comfortable with a Nokia. No, try giving it to me. <laughs> That's not what I am saying. <laughs> That's not what Paul is saying. Okay. Well, it's an old Nokia or an iPhone. Or in which languages our little children understand? Whether it is a Reebok or a Bata. Whether it is a Bata or a Reebok, I am happy. As long as my feet are covered. Or it's a Levi's. Or buy one, get three. three. You know what? That's what scripture says. This is the key. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, and then we'll close. Because we have to fight this enemy, the green eyed monster who will rear its head constantly. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry. Nothing. If there is one thing certain in this life, I'm telling you, all your fashion designer wear, all your gadgets, somebody will enjoy it when it's time for you to go. You are not going to take anything. You can do what the ancient pharaohs did, take all the valuables and put it along with your dead body and bury it, but you will never use it. It's just another symptom of envy. If nobody will use it, you, I won't use it, I will not let anybody use it. So when I'm buried also, I will leave, bury it with me. Some thief will break it and take it and go. Godliness with contentment is a great thing. And you know what? Verse 8. Having food and clothing, with these we shall be. Is there anybody who didn't eat today? I don't see anybody naked anyway. Question is, but are you content? You content. Then is tomorrow you go back to work and you see somebody else who sits next to you is wearing something beautiful, expensive. Will you be able to rejoice? And the second question: Would you be able to say really from the heart, you know what, bro, you really look good in that. Look good. Will you be able to? Or deep inside is, I wish it was mine. He doesn't look good in it. I know I will look good in it. <laughs> you need to realize what exactly envy does. It kills love for us. Suddenly we feel this 
feeling, I don't like him anymore. And we stopped loving him without any reason. Simply because you wore a shirt which you wanted but you couldn't afford. Or the girl next to you has got something which you always wanted and you could never buy. And suddenly you realize, I don't like her anymore. I don't want to talk to her today. And envy has killed love. And God says, love does not envy. Amen? Love does not envy. Let go. Let go. Church, let go. Let go of whatever you have to let go. Let go. Let God be God. You will have contentment in your life. Don't meditate on things you shouldn't be meditating. I'm talking to a lot of people. Do not meditate upon things you should be medi- shouldn't be meditating. Let go of what has gone in your life. Let go. Don't hold on to it. It's not meant for you. Now it is with somebody else. Don't sit there and envy. Don't sit there and be jealous. Don't sit there and got on, get on your knees and start praying. I pray it will never work for them. Being a pit for you, like so many people are doing in the city, praying that I pray his church will break and his ministry will break. I know they're praying because I've heard they're praying. Nothing is going to happen to me. But I really pray for them, Lord, touch them. They don't know the hole they're digging for themselves. Dig holes like that. If somebody has hurt you in the past, don't dig holes. Don't dig holes. You're not digging a hole for them. Like they said, but no? revenge is the poison. You drink to kill somebody. Dig. They're talking practical things over here. You have to fight this constantly. Constantly you have to fight this and say, Lord, keep my heart straight before thee. I want to bless them. I want to bless them. I want to intercede for them. Because I understand their pain. Their pain is real. But Lord, let them not dig a hole for themselves. Let them not dig a hole for themselves. Because sometimes the holes you dig, you look at next week. If you keep digging that hole, you cannot come out of it. Because you always may not find a Joseph. King Saul dug a hole for himself. And what what David could do to him made no difference. Finally, the end of King Saul was he fell upon his own soul and died. Simple reason. You look, one sentence. The women say, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And Saul looked at David in envy. It's all. It's done. Don't do it. Don't do it. More men and women and families and homes and churches and institutions have been destroyed by this green-eyed monster called envy. Amen? Shall we stand? Father, we have heard your word. Your word has spoken to all of us. I believe you have spoken to me, you have spoken to each one of us here. We are all guilty of this, O God. We are all guilty. We are all guilty. All of us struggle with this for years. Because we saw somebody else prospering. We thought they didn't deserve it. And we were upset we didn't have it without realizing you love us all the same. There's no difference in the way you love us. You love us all the same. For you, you are, we are all children. You are not Jacob. You are Jesus. Jacob may have loved Joseph more, but Jesus doesn't love me more. He loves me and he loves each one here the same way. Everyone the same way with an everlasting love. But to us you are saying, if I love you, You are saying, you will keep my commandments. And you are telling each one of us, if you love me, you will keep my word. Word in your personal life. My word in your public life. And the word that brings us together as a family. If you love me, you will keep it. But Father, we rest assured on the truth of your word. That there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate us from your love. 
nothing of God. And we rest in that love. As we go out of this place today, help us, Spirit of God, never to doubt the love of the Father for us. Every time we doubt it, help us to look at the cross and believe. And then in that love, labor. In that strength that comes from above, labor, so that our works may be found, approved in your sight. And we may be overcomers on that day. And be seated with Christ Jesus on the right hand side of the Father. First to kill envy, jealousy, covetousness in our lives daily. To take up that cross, the only cross, only the cross can kill that. And die to envy and self-seeking. Envy and self-seeking. We seek nothing of God. We only seek that we decrease and you increase. That we will not have the joy other than that of the bridegroom's friend. We will not steal the bridegroom's joy. That's yours. The glory is yours. The honor is yours. The power is yours. It's all yours, O God. We came with nothing. We'll go with nothing. We have nothing to boast about. Because you are the one who blessed us and preserved us till this moment. Thank you, Father. As as a church, we go out to our homes, to our institutions. I pray, Father, your love will consume us. And we will love our brother. Love our brother. We will not curse him. We will not accept their curses over our lives too. We will cut it away. But we will love them. We will bless them. We will pray for them. Until our last breath, we will continue praying. Help us to have the ministry of Joseph in our lives. Then you will turn it around. All that the enemy meant it for harm, you will turn it around and make it good for us. Then truly we will be able to say, this is good and marvelous. And it is truly the God's work. Thank you, Father. Commit all of the pastors into their hands. Every one of them. Dear brothers who are standing up in difficult times, in difficult situations. They don't have a name. Their robe was taken off, stripped naked by this world. And the Pharisees that are around because they have nothing to stand on but the call you gave, the spirit you gave them. And I pray, Father, they will stand strong today before the thousands that will come into all our churches. Let them stand strong and see power and with authority. With your hand of protection, be there upon all our churches where the storm has hit protect and preserve those lives of God. That your purpose may be done in their lives too. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. We love you. We love you. So good to us. We love you. I praise you, your worship of God. Give you glory and honor. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.